Shireen from our Music Cares team will come up and share a little bit more about that. Also, if you enjoy tonight's program, please consider becoming a member of the Grammy Museum. Uh, not only can you come to programs all throughout the year for free, um, but you also uh, find out about exhibits ahead of time and what have you. So there's just so many benefits. Do we have any members of the museum in the house tonight? Okay. Awesome. I'll raise my hand. I remember. Okay. And so anyhow, before we get started, I just want to say a few thank yous. Uh, first, to our partner for this evening, BET. It's been a wonderful experience working with their amazing team on this event. I just want to give a very special thank you to Jermaine Hall, uh, Kara Barnett, and Andrew Ricketts, as well as the rest of the amazing BET team. I'd also like to thank the Grammy Museum leadership, Scott Goldman and Rita George, our senior leadership at the Recording Academy, as well as the entire Recording Academy staff who worked really hard to make tonight's event happen. I just want to take a moment to mention their names. Kelly Purcell, Shireen Jonti reed Yvonne Faison, Lindsay Gabler, Williams, Mazen Alawar, she's recently married, uh, Alexis Maurer, Sean Ruderman, Andy Cox, and our fantastic LA chapter intern, Hannah Koulis. We'd also like to thank the artists' teams who were also very supportive of this event from the very beginning. It has been a pleasure working with all of you. And last but not least, we'd like to thank all of our Recording Academy members who are, who are here tonight. We truly value your membership and your involvement with us. And so without further ado, I'm going to begin introducing tonight's panelists and our moderator. Our moderator is currently the head of original content programming at Ambrosia for Heads. He is formerly the editor-in-chief at Hip Hop DX. He has been featured on Revolt TV's Revolt Live as well as in Billboard magazine. He recently participated in a debate at the prestigious Oxford Union on whether Kanye West is more relevant than William Shakespeare. Uh, just, uh, this moderator has also been the centerpiece of digital campaigns for Lexus, Honda, Brisk, and Simple Mobile, and has hosted concerts and panels nationwide. He's currently based in Los Angeles. Please give a warm round of applause for our moderator for the evening, Justin Hunt. <laughs> Next. Our next guest is a double board certified psychiatrist. He is a thought leader and influencer in the field of human behavior. He founded and oversees the Lumion Center in Beverly Hills, an outpatient treatment center for addictions, psychological issues, and personal development. He's been all over news media, and you've seen him on Oprah, Dr. Phil, Dr. Oz, CNN, Domestic and International. He currently hosts the show Reef Madness. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Reef Kareem. Our next guest, she is the hip hop professional. She's also the author of the Hip Hop Professional 2.0. With over 25 years of music business experience with companies such as Sony, Columbia, Capital, and more, she has worked with Prince, Outkast, and Usher, just to name a few. An advocate for many social issues, she has started several initiatives, including the No Reservations Needed Food Drive, among many others, including her latest initiative, Silence the Shame, which she hopes will help to peel back the layers of shame and stigma as it relates to mental health. Please give a warm welcome to Ms. Shanti Das. Our next panelist is a Grammy nominee, Raised on the south side of Chicago, he first came to prominence as part of the rap collective Save Money. His 2013 solo debut mixtape, Innate Tape, set the stage for his double XL freshman cover in 2014. He dropped his critically, his critically acclaimed EP, There's a Lot Going On, in the spring of 2016, and recently released new capsule, The Manuscript. He'll be releasing his debut album this coming summer. He's also been very vocal about his feelings on the topics of mental health, and he's a voice for a new generation of artists. Please give a warm welcome to Vic Mensa. Thank you. 
Our next panelist is a five-time Grammy winner. All of her wins happening in the last four years. Most recently taking home Best R&B Album at the 59th Grammy Awards. She has shared the marquee with Prince, Stevie Wonder, Snoop Dogg, Frank Ocean, Mary J. Blige, and more. Her collaborators include Kendrick Lamar, Pharrell, Robert Glasper, Thundercat, Kamasi Washington, and others. She's the co-founder of Real Music Rebels, where quality musicianship meets social consciousness. She's also served on the Recording Academy's Los Angeles chapter board and, and has supported numerous initiatives in the areas of music education and advocacy. She also has a new album coming soon. Please give a warm welcome to Miss Layla Hathaway. Our final panelist is a living legend and 12-time Grammy nominee. Before launching his solo career in 2000, he racked up a string of hits in the late 70s and 80s as a frontman with the Gap Band. The pioneering R&B funk group charted such records as Outstanding, Yearning for Your Love, Burn Rubber on Me, You Dropped a Bomb on Me, and Early in the Morning. <laughs> Since then, he has released six solo albums and received uh, BET's 2013 Lifetime Achievement Award. In the years between the Gap Band's heyday, he survived drug, drug and alcohol addiction, homelessness, and prostate cancer. He chronicled his odds-defying life and career in 2015 best-selling autobiography, I Am Charlie Wilson. Sober now for 22 years, the singer says, I wouldn't have believed I'd be where I am right now. That's why I shout every night, because I thank God for allowing me to be here. Somebody say amen. 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 Would you please give a warm welcome to Mr. Charlie, Uncle Charlie Wilson. Up, man, this is. Um, I think uh, I think I speak for everyone here. This is. These are two topics that are really one topic that's close to all of us, and uh, we definitely want to thank the Recording Academy, Music Cares, BET, and JRL for having each of us today. This is an important conversation. Let's give a round of applause. I want to start with you, Vic. I mean, uh, I think JRL gave a, a great introduction when he talked about how open and outspoken you have been on this topic. You've talked about your own experiences and how different substances have helped you with creativity, uh, different experiences that you've had um, with a near-fatal acid trip. Uh, how, how have you been able to make sure you can control your, your uh, substances while maintaining your creativity? Which I think is something that's a fear for most artists. You know, for me, I could remember the moment when my brain started to change. I was maybe 15 years old, and I started smoking weed when I was 11 years old. Um, and anxiety and depression runs in my family. So I guess as I started to get older and come into adolescence and later into adulthood, I could, I could, I could feel the things that I was putting into my body start to impact me differently. And those effects start to carry on into times when I was completely sober. Um, you know, and I, I was lucky enough like a year and a half ago to have a person in my life that was able to make a selfless act in taking a back seat to seeing me get better and, and push me to go get help. Um, because, I mean, you know, as the saying goes, hurt people hurt people. And maybe certain things that happened in my past, and we, we all have a, a, a long repressed history, you know, especially in our community. Um, and so, as, as I said, I, I had somebody in my life that was, that was, that was kind enough to, to push me to get help, and it was, it was only then that I, that I really realized that I, that I could be that, that better vision of myself that I could remember because there was a period of time from adolescence when you know we, we start fucking around with this stuff early and as that spiral kept going and kept getting deeper and I'm reaching out grabbing onto different things to try to bring me up to where I 
I thought I should be or where I was in my perfect vision of my world, um, I just started to lose sight of who I really was. And I, I forgot that I could be happy. I forgot I could go through a day without, you know, just feeling ultimately suicidal. And it was, it was, it was a dark time for me. And once I was able to, you know, go sit down and really talk to somebody and start unpacking these things, start unpacking these things that I, I might have never even realized I'm dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, you know? Um, then I, I was able to realize that the, the path for me wasn't, wasn't one that's like drugged out rock star, you know what I mean? I might look a certain way, but, it's, but I, I wasn't about to, I, I didn't want to let that become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And when you start looking at these things that, like I said, you might not even think you're dealing with, I, and you, you start to realize that, it, you know, w w I was dealing with feelings of insecurity that maybe I had from infancy, you know? <clears throat> there, there was a specific moment that I, I remember realizing um, that it, it was actually crazy because it was kind of a, an experience that was before I, kind of, I came to this place of a different understanding of, of myself and substances and, and the role that it should, shouldn't play in my life. Um, but basically, you know, I realized that there was like a, a pain I was dealing with from being a small child and my mother's white from New York, my pops is from Ghana, he's from West Africa. And um, I realized that there, there was a, like a sense of um, not fitting in that I had been dealing with ever since being a little, a, a baby and seeing my mother and being wondering why I, I, I didn't have blonde hair and blue eyes, you know? And that's something that when I'm 22 years old, it's not occurring to me that maybe I'm dealing with pain from, from being a baby, you know, pain from coming onto this earth. And so, like I said, when I started to unpack those things, that I, I realized that, that I had to take care of myself, for real, for real. And, and I had to be conscious of these things. And everybody, everybody's everybody's brain is different, everybody's chemistry is different. And my chemistry is such that, like, it, it's, I have to be careful with what I allow to mess with that wiring. It was long-winded, but I hope it made sense. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think about the, 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 the challenge that, that takes, one, to un unpack all of those things, but two, to be able to continue to live a, uh, a creative lifestyle later on, um, to be able to continue to be on the road where you don't necessarily have, uh, you're not eating healthy every day. You're not necessarily around a consistent um, uh, schedule or structure. Uh, you know, uh, Charlie Wilson, you've, you know, congratulations to you. I mean, you've, you've been sober now for 22 years, if I'm yes, not mistaken. Yes. That's a round of applause. Thank you. Yes. As a, I know a lot of young artists, and I've talked, I've spoken to a number of young artists mm -hmm. who, who really do feel like they need to lean on certain substances in order to maintain that creativity. And we'll also talk about the challenges they face when they are on the road. Mm -hmm. How were you able to structure your life, you know, uh, past your addictions while still maintaining your, your career? Wow. It, <laughs> I, I, I just think you should, first of all, you should work on yourself before you try to do any work. You know, you should just work on yourself and, and um, make sure you have all the tools that you need for the rest of your life before you try to start going to work and all that. I know a lot of people, you know, who uh, uh, was getting high and, um, and say, I got to go back to my career and just run right out there and, the, you know, the first week, um, they're back to doing the same thing. I just think you should work on yourself. But I, I, take, I, take, I keep a, a, a very special person with me all the time, and that's my wife. And um, she's basically almost like a rehab. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> she keeps everybody right. at bay, man. It's like, I don't care who you are. That's my daddy. Go around that way and we'll talk to <laughs> And so everything is 
pushed away from me the first few uh-huh. years. I mean, she, under, she understood exactly what my mind was <coughs> thinking at all times. I mean, because I was young, first of all, let me just go back a little bit. I was young in my addiction, and she was just, she was just there, man, and uh, um, keeping everything, everybody away from me, family and everybody uh, that I ever had any contact with that, was, that I got high with or doesn't matter, family members or whatever. So that was great for me. And um, so I remember being on the road, and I was not, I hadn't had that many months sober, and the guy walked up to me, and, and I gave him five and said hello to him, and he put a big rock cocaine in my hand. And I was like, dude, I don't get high no more. He said, well, I heard that. Well, if you heard that, why are you giving me the drugs? I was yeah. like, yeah. why would you do that? I mean, just, and it made me shake because the rock was big. Like the kind I would love to have. <laughs> so I was nervous that night, and I went home, and she was like, when I got back, she said, you okay? I was like, yeah, man, but jeez. It's like, uh, so you have to really be careful. I, and so I just keep my wife with me everywhere I go. We 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We go everywhere except the public bathrooms, and that's just, <laughs> and that's just it. I mean, yeah. you know, and and I really, really work hard at it. Uh, it's 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 real dangerous, man. Because, well, one, I don't go anywhere either. I don't go to clubs, and I don't go outing. I don't do after parties, the party after the party. I don't do none of that. You know, I get off the stage. I'm toe up tired, and I can't wait to get in the bed because I'm tired. Because I put a lot of effort into the work. Uh, you know, it's 90 minutes, it's up-tempo mostly, and, and man, you know, and I'm acting like I'm 24, mm-hmm. I'm 25. <laughs> <laughs> so I work hard at that, and, and, uh, and so, you know, I just, we go straight, straight to, 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 to the room, yeah. and we just unwind that way. Uh, but I just think that everybody should just pay attention to the signs on the wall, man. It's just like, you know, don't go into slippery places, if you're trying to stay sober, don't go into places where there's drugs and alcohol. You should just shouldn't go because yeah. what's going to happen is you're going to definitely slip. If the temptation is too strong. Yeah. I found that out a long time ago. Thanks for letting me share that. No, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and that's that's really the power of the support system. Absolutely, and you're lucky enough to have a, a strong a strong support system. Yes. Uh, Doctor uh, Reef Kareem, he's you've spoken quite a bit about. Uh, how superstardom makes all of this that much more challenging, you know. Um, and I'm sure you've seen both sides of this equation. I mean, we've, you know, both Vic and and and, uh, and Charlie Wilson here. They both had examples of people who've been able to help them unpack some of the challenges they've had and keep them clean. Uh, how important is the team? You know, your manager, your family members. Um, you know, what type of role can they play when it comes to being a positive impact? But also, what kind of things have you seen that, you know, some teams have done that have actually pushed their made things a little bit more challenging maybe mm-hmm. for the artists that they work with. Yeah, I, I've had the opportunity to help a lot of people in this space in addiction and mental health, and uh, quite a few of them are, are well-known performers, really talented people, celebrities. And something that I've, I've just learned over time is that special care is not good care. You know, I, I've had a lot of opportunities to see people, and their entire entourage will come up to me and go, all right, we need you to help, help this guy out. I'm like, well, where's the guy? And they're like, oh, well, he's, he's in his, you know, he's, in, he's at his place. He's, uh, he doesn't want to come out. I'm like, well, why not? Well, doesn't he want the help? No, 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 we're, it's cool. We got this for him. We got this for him. And, and that's the problem is you don't have it for him. The, the, the reality is there's the performer and there's the, who really is an alias. Because you've got, you've got the, the, the person. Charlie mentioned something about the self, right, and understanding the self, which is so incredibly important because for a lot of performers, who they are on stage is a version of themselves, but it's not really themselves. Right. And the brain of a homeless person and the brain of a celebrity and the brain of a president are all similar brains in regards to our reward circuitry. And, and all the, you know, the reward that goes on when you ingest drugs or when you have a mental health issue. So I have to get past that cloak of the celebrity or of the performer to get to know the real person underneath because that's the brain that I'm working with. And I have to dissolve 
all of that stuff to find the true identity of that person. So when Charlie's talking about the self, I mean, I'm, I'm a big believer in understanding your identity because a lot of people don't even know what their true identity is. So now how do the, the enablers, potential enablers or potential support staff, you've got enablers or you've got support and your team can do either of the two. Yep. You know, in, in Charlie's case, his wife is the supporter, right? That's the it. primary supporter. Um, I would just, if you're, your wife's here, right? Yeah, you might want to go in. Yeah. You might want to go in the bathroom with him too. You know, <laughs> you don't know what goes on in there. Uh, but uh, so the enabler part is when your support team, your team that's supposed to be supportive, is afraid to confront you, either because they're on your payroll, or they're afraid of you, or they're conflict avoidant, or they don't want to to you know start up something rattle the system yeah. and it's if you love that person and you care about that person i don't care who you are whether you're the manager the publicist or the wife you need to confront that person yes you know and if you don't you're enabling the system that's right and yep. a true support network is someone or an entire team that will be totally truthful with you and if you need to go to rehab for three months or if you need to go see a mental health practitioner because there's something acute going on with you, even if it stops the tour, even if it stops everything that you're doing at that moment in time, you need to protect you before you can go out and do other things. Absolutely. Well, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, a, that's an important thing. And I, I'm not sure how often we think about the, um, I guess, from the executive side or from the manager's side mm -hmm. of these situations when they see their artists or when they see someone they're close to going through some of these challenges. I know. Uh, Shanti, you've had a number of experiences in that, in that situation. Um, from the other side of the coin, you know, uh, have you run into any or, or seen any tools that have been helpful or what, uh, what are t some things that people can help think about when they do see some, someone close to them that are going through these challenges? So quite honestly, from an executive standpoint, because I've had the good fortune to work for over five different uh, record companies over a 25-year span, and we just didn't talk about it. Um, <laughs> yeah. I hate to say it, but um, I have to be 100% real. We, we cared about the artists, right? We wanted them to be healthy, but it was about the bottom line. And I put together many a promo tours in my day, and the artists just go and go and go. And sometimes, you know, we would blame it on them being exhausted, but sometimes they would be depressed. You know, it's a lot of sacrifice that goes into becoming an artist and a superstar. And the amount of pressure that comes from the record company sometimes um, is tough. And so, I don't think um, any of my artists particularly expressed to us that they were going through any mental health concerns or disorders, but we saw the pain. We saw the frustration. Um, and we would encourage them to go to the doctor if they had a cold or you know, if something else serious happened. But as it relates to mental health, nobody wants to be labeled. No one wants to feel like something is wrong with them. And I think that's the one thing about the entertainment industry. Um, from an executive and an artist standpoint that bothered me is we got to be on. 24-7, it's all about you know, putting up this mask and this facade, and people are hurting. Um, you know, we've lost several executives uh, to suicide. Uh, my dear friend, the late, great Shakir Stewart, uh, Chris Lighty, who I know there's still some question on whether he committed suicide or not, but you know, I listened to the recent podcast that they did um, on Chris on Spotify, and it just talked about some of the mental health issues that he had, and it's just something that we didn't talk about, and for me, I think it's uh, refreshing to see what Music Cares does now, but we didn't really know about it. Um, and that was just you know, 10, 15 years ago um, that they would come in and help and give the support like that to a lot of artists or even executives for that matter. And we got to do better. Yeah. Um, yeah. We push these artists to a point sometimes of no return. And you know, we all want to win. We all want to make money and, and live a great lifestyle, but at the end of the day, you know, I tell people 24 seven, artists are regular people and we have to treat them as such. And so when you have the enablers and you see the entourages and people around them and, you know, obviously from a label perspective, we try to talk to the entourage and get them to help. But a lot of artists just want yes people around them and everybody's tiptoeing around the situation and afraid to address it head on. And I, for one, have, have suffered from depression and I know we'll get into that a little bit later, but it's time to speak up and be honest about it. And we have to let artists and executives know what resources are available so we can save a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, this, I mean the, the, statistics, the, the statistics around this are, are striking and I'm not even sure how, 
many people are familiar with this. But for example, the National Alliance of Mental Illness says that African Americans are 20% more likely to suffer from mental illness. And this is, this is something that we don't address in our communities mm -hmm. consistently, which, which I think you've, you've touched on there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Layla, I'm not sure how many people might be you know, familiar with maybe some of the experiences that you've had around that, or at least within your family. Um, I know that that is the one consistency that I've heard from everyone talk about, which yeah. is how it's, how difficult it is to address these issues and share how we feel about these things. Yeah, particularly amongst people of color. You know, I think, I feel like everybody my age has at least one uncle that <laughs> lived in his room that didn't come out, that only walked to mass. Mm -hmm. You know, we all had a super sensitive uncle or super sensitive cousin and nobody talked about mental illness. So I w it was not until I was about 20 years old that I even say paranoid schizophrenic <clears throat> out loud. My father was a paranoid schizophrenic. And at the time that he started exhibiting this sickness, my mother tried to get him help and his whole, everyone around him tried to insulate him from getting help. <clears throat> nobody could talk about it. Nobody understood what was happening. Uh, nobody understood the medication. Um, just that we have the dialogue now to look at somebody in the eye and say, hey, tell me how you're feeling. You know, I don't even think it was really discussed in that way, you know? Yeah. Well, it feels like we're at a tipping point. Like, I look at some younger artists, I'm looking at, um, I think Kid Cudi last year was really brave in expressing some of the challenges that he was going through. Uh, I think Chance the Rapper did an interview last year with Complex where he talked about some of these issues. Um, uh, Shanti, I mean, I know we, you've gone through some of, some different, gone through depression and had different abilities, or excuse me, different uh, things that you were challenged with. What was the reluctance, or was there a reluctance to share those, those feelings with people? Yeah, you, of course. Uh, so my dad committed suicide when I was seven months old. And uh, yeah, Father's Day was this weekend, and it's always tough. I'm 46, and it still doesn't get any easier. People tend to think that, because I didn't know my dad, that it's easier, but it never is. And so that cloud of, of suicide um, hung over my head for many years, and I kind of just threw myself into my work, and I just wanted to be successful. And I wouldn't even let my mom bring my dad's name up. Um, I didn't understand what suicide meant, and I always thought that when my back was up against the wall, is this something that I'm going to do? And I remember it was uh, 2001, and I went through my first real bout of depression. I was living in New York City, and I finally saw a therapist, but I kept it very quiet. I didn't tell any of my friends there, especially none of my colleagues, because again, you know, I think people, when you're labeled, it's looked at as, as a sign of weakness, and no one wants to be perceived as weak in this industry, because you always got two people trying to take your spot. And so everybody's trying to you know, stay on top of their game. But um, it was difficult for me to be able to open up and share, because as a family, we didn't go to counseling when my dad killed himself. And uh, four years ago, my best friend committed suicide. I have a family member that's bipolar, and I suffer from depression. Um, and I came out and started talking about it three years ago, and I was terrified. Like, because you know how people on the timeline scrolling through, and when I first mentioned that I was depressed, people were like, what? What do you mean you're depressed? You're so successful. You're this, you're that. And I'm like, I'm human, right? Um, and then two years ago, I had suicidal ideation. And um, I'm cool. I'm here, right? Yes. I'm, I'm still here. And um, thank God every day for getting me through that. Um, but this is my testimony, and that's why I started my initiative, Silence of Shame, um, to peel back the layers of shame and stigma around mental health so that we can normalize the conversation. What people don't understand is it's not necessarily always the more serious disorders, right, like bipolar or BPD or <clears throat> paranoid schizophrenic. You are one traumatic experience away from possibly dealing with the mental health disorder. It could be the loss of a spouse, a parent. Um, I was talking to Vic about this because he's from Chicago. These kids in these urban communities who happen to see their homeboy or their uncle or their cousin or their parent get shot in front of them, guess what? They're going to experience PTSD. PTSD. Mm -hmm. People just think the military. Mm -hmm. No, that's PTSD. That's real. And so, you know, what we're trying to do is really be a voice in the community and bridge the gap. And, you know, we did a social media launch in May, just a month, almost a little bit over a month ago, and we got 90 million impressions in one day. Wow. 
and okay. I'm just so grateful because we had everyone from Ludacris to Russell Simmons to JoJo to Candy from Real Housewives, like everybody around the country even had posts from Tokyo and Cape Town. So it just shows me that people want to talk about it. And so I applaud everybody on this panel today because, y'all, we're going to save some lives. I, I like to say making mm -hmm. lives. We're making lives right now, and we're letting people know it's okay to get help. Yeah, it's okay. All right. It's, it's particularly important in minority communities, and minority men especially, more, even more than anyone mm -hmm. else. And, you know, I'm Indian. I'm obviously not African American. But uh, in the Indian community, uh, I'll do a talk or I'll go to, I'll go to an event, and, and I'll talk about mental health, and people will literally be like this. Like, they, they, they don't even want to see. Really? They don't want to know. They don't want to make eye contact with me. But those same people, when I'm walking out to the parking lot to my car and I pass the bushes, people are literally popping out of the bushes going, hey, Doc, I got this friend, you know, and they're like hitting me up. And, and it's, it, it's, it's so stigmatizing and shameful to talk about anything above the neck that's problematic. Anything in your brain, you can break your arm, you can, man, I broke my leg, jumping out, you know. But you, you have something going on with your brain, and it's, it's, it's a very scary thing. So anything we can do, I applaud everybody that's here, anything we can do to destigmatize this mm. is, is incredibly important. And, you know, Vic said something um, about trauma, you know, and, and, and it's, which has been reiterated on the panel. You know, the, the theories behind addiction and the connection between addiction and mental health, there's a couple of different things. And I heard both of them when Vic was talking. One, one is about, he mentioned something about, you know, needing to, to up, up a level. Like, like I, I was constantly trying to reach, like, a certain level. In, in, uh, in addiction, one of the theories is dopamine depletion, which is there's too little dopaminergic tone, too little of this neurotransmitter in somebody that may have an addiction. And because it's low, you're constantly chasing a feeling. You're taking whatever you need to take or doing whatever you need to do to try to increase that level to feel normal. And that's why somebody will say, Doc, the first time I had that drink, I felt totally normal. Doc, the first time I did that line of blow, I felt normal. They really mean that. Because from a neurobiological perspective, that's what's happening. The other theory behind it is trauma-based. And this comes to the PTSD. It comes to the lifestyle. It comes to the neighborhood. It comes to the violence. Trauma, even as a neonate, even in the womb, there's, there's studies about trauma from that mom, what that mom's experiencing can pass on to the kid. From any age up until adulthood, your ability to handle trauma and how much trauma you ingest in your system and your brain can absolutely make you more vulnerable to having a mental health or addictive disorder. Yeah. You know, I think um, as we continue to talk about how we need to bring awareness to, to this topic um, and that connection to between addiction and mental illness is something I don't think that most people are aware of. I don't. There's, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but there is a point where addiction becomes, or the brain becomes altered, so it, it kind of is a, an example of mental illness after a certain point. There's like 60% overlap between the two. Wow. It's a lot. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. I had a finance professor who said 5% of anything is a whole lot. 6% <laughs> uh, kind of sounds the same. I think when I listen to music, when I listen to a lot of songs where artists are addressing this topic, maybe that's the reason why they, they tend to hit us harder, because there is a 6% overlap with some of the things that we view as common or some of the things that we're afraid to even talk about. Um, on, your, on your capsule you just dropped, the manuscript, there's a song called uh, Rolling Like a Stoner. It's a really honest song um, about um, just life as a rock star, kind of, as it kind of sounds like, Vic. Uh, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah, you know, actually, I, 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 was, I was talking to somebody about this earlier today because it occurs to me, you know, when, when making music and having a demographic that's a lot of young kids, you know, that I don't want to be misinterpreted as trying to mislead the youth, like go pop pills, go drink alcohol, do drugs. But at the same time, there, there are certain situations that where I feel like this, this music, this is almost, at, this is at this point like my drug, you know? music and this is this is my release this is what gets me up in the morning and this is what keeps me going so I kind of have to be honest about my experiences and really the the bottom line of that song and the 
the most important line of that song is, I got a problem nobody knows. So I'm, I'm saying these things that, that I've done or do, and I do them for this reason. I got a problem nobody knows. And she said something uh, a couple minutes ago that, you know, really made me think because I'm from Chicago, I'm from the south side of Chicago, and south side of Chicago is a war zone at this point in time. And it's got casualties that, you know, in past years when we had troops in Iraq, they weren't dying at the levels mm -hmm. that our people were dying on the south side <clears throat> of Chicago and are dying on the south side of Chicago today. And, you know, I look at friends of mine, I was at a funeral maybe last Friday for a 23 year old friend of mine. And uh, I look at other friends of mine and everybody's doped up all the time. Everybody's drinking lean, popping pills all the time. And they don't really stop to think why, why they might be doing that. And, you know, people look from the outside of the south side of Chicago, or just Chicago in general, and, um, I mean, the, the police don't come to the neighborhood <laughs> because they're like, let them kill each other. People look from the outside into our community and... Uh, you know, they look at us as savages, and it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy to where savages become like a, it's a thing, that's like a, like a thumbs up, like I'm a badge, savage. Like you know, a it's a badge of honor, I'm savage. Um, the PTSD is just so real when it's like, when it's like, you, you go through adolescence losing people to gun violence, like it, it just becomes so normalized. And uh, I, I've been to way more funerals of people in their teens than I've, I've never been to somebody's funeral that died of natural causes, you know? So we deal with these things in other ways and, and we don't have that support system that keeps getting brought up. That support system doesn't really exist in the neighborhood where it's like, uh, you know, some, somebody for, people for kids to talk to and, and, and to, to try to deal with these things in a in like a, a healing way, the healing doesn't exist, and and I think until we until we can put that focus on on healing the hurt, then there, there can't be any moving forward. And this and the savage shit is just it's it's self perpetuating. So I really appreciate you know the things that you spoke to me about backstage and and just this this entire conversation. And I hope that you know we're able to take this and take it to where I'm from, and and open up these types of dialogues and open you know actual avenues and channels for us to deal with these problems because we're not gonna stop killing each other until we can s stop hurting from who already died. That's what we're dealing with in Chicago. Let me, just for a second, just because I think that a lot of people who aren't from Chicago look in and they don't realize this that. What you have going on right now is just a vicious cycle. And it's a lot of people, you know, my age, I'm 24, I just turned 24 years old, that it, it's a revenge circle. And you can't break that chain easily. So it's, it's so much that, that we have to, like, be real about it. And we got to try to help kids cope with what happened. Because if you can't come to terms with the past, then you can't move into the future. Can, can I say something real quick? Yes. So to your point, I, I, and I'm all for freedom of speech. And I feel like artists shouldn't be censored in any way. But as it relates to mental health, like we've got to get to the artists so they can stop popping the pills and just saying, okay, self-medicate. Because oftentimes if you have a chemical imbalance and you're self-medicating, it's gonna further tip the scale. And for a lot of these kids that don't have any real money, like the synthetic weed, obviously that's terrible. If you already are having symptoms of bipolar disorder or depression, it's horrible if you use synthetic weed. So what do we do as a community of musicians and people in the entertainment community to get them to talk about actually seeing a therapist or going to a doctor. I don't know how creatively we can put that in there, but I think that's got to shift a little bit too, because even the article that I read, with, you mentioned Chance the Rapper, um, and I love him, I'm a huge fan, but I, part of it he kind of joked about, you know, oh, I just go get high, you know, when I feel myself getting like that. But 
we've got to reshape that too and, and, and rebuild a new narrative so these kids know that getting high is not the best coping skills when you're seriously dealing with mental health issues. What do you think? <laughs> well, me personally, I, I, as I look at myself, as I look at young Charlie Wilson when I was uh, a, young, a young boy, but I, I started very, very young, 12 years old or 13 years old, uh, dibbling and dabbling with stuff, mm. uh, drinking and, and um, you know, just, let me just say it like this. I'm going to use it some, 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 some years. Basically, I went to a party in 1960-something and didn't leave the party till 1995. <laughs> <laughs> now, I must, be, I must have a, a mental problem. Anybody who can stay up, not one day, not two days, four, five, six, seven, eight, not 12, 14, 16 days without food or water, getting high, that must be a mental patient. And so, but I've lived through all of that because, see, I believe in God. I believe in a higher power, and I think this is why he's allowed me. Yes. He's allowed me to, 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 to come and, and, and continue to sing, and, and he said, well, you're going to shout. And you're gonna give me some glory, and you're gonna give me some praise, and 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 I'm and I thank God for that because I don't know anybody that could try to try to start a career like a great grandpa or something, <laughs> and have all of those number one records, and have all of these Grammy nominations, and still making number one records, and still selling and, and selling out arenas. Now that's got to be God. Mm -hmm. And so if you if you don't have a higher power, you don't have anything. That's strong enough to lean on, man. You ain't gonna make it. I mean, you know, we, you can't, you can't just, you can't just like, we can wallow in in, in the past, and we can have all kinds of excuses, and wallow in all of these excuses, man. It ain't gonna do nothing but keep you getting high. It's like you have to stop, recognize the point. Like people die, a lot of young kids die, man. They just dying, you know. Because they don't have anything else. They don't know anything else. They see other people kill when they're nine. They see other 13 year olds getting killed and they like, I want to kill. Hmm. Right. Nobody's even talking to them about just life. Let's live. Let's live and, and talk to the other young ones that they're coming up. And I don't mean, it's, it's, it's um, I just thank God for myself, man, and that, that, he, that he's allowed me to be, to come here and, and, and right. still testify and, and, and share my story, man. So I, I don't know if that, well, I think you're. I think you're an interesting case, right? I mean, because you've you've had the best of both worlds. You've been yes. able to lean on your faith to get you through it, Absolutely. but you went and got help. Yes. And I think a lot of times we do one without the other. Yeah. Let me say this thing. I, it was seven. I went through seven rehab doors. I ate. Mm. And I went because somebody else told me to go. But the the one time I said I am so sick and tired of being sick and tired of just sick and tired of this nasty looking person in the mirror. And when I got to that rehab this last, that last time, you know, I was, I must have smoked my brains half out going around in circles before I went in there. But, but when I did go in, I was like, okay, this has got to be it. God, if, if, this, if I don't get it this time, then I'm going to die. I already know I'm going to die. So, you know, hey, man, it was, it's, um, Ooh, man, it's crazy. I I I I I I live to, to thank God and to, to share my story with, with with other people and 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 young young upcoming stars and it's man. I used to think I always had to have a Long Island iced tea or gotta go. And then when I started snorting cocaine, I, was, I, I thought I had to go get that before I can go on stage. I mean, I I, I wasted all of those years when I could have did it when I was twenty something years old. What I'm doing now, but I thank God He allowed me to just. Circle around there, you knucklehead, until you, I'm gonna get, until you get it right. Yeah. And then I'm going to give us what you really want to get. But what you got to get right first. And uh, so, you know, we got to keep sharing and talking about mental illness <clears throat> and, and, and drugs and alcohol and, and people OD and, and people killing each other. We got to keep talking about it to the younger generation. And, and whatever you're going through, you have to just, you know, you got to keep telling the young books. Hey, man. Look, don't go kill him, man. Just let him live. You, you, you see, I mean, I don't know if that's the I don't know if that's the solution, especially in Chicago, man. I see so many bricks with names on it. 
I almost, I almost, I just wanted to cry. I went to see the wall with all of the bricks, with all of the kids, and they, it's so, like he said it, man. It's more people, more kids down in Chicago on the south side than it is in Iraq. It's like that's that was crazy to me. And what's the life? What's what's the life expectancy? They don't get what? They barely get twenty. Some of them. <laughs> yeah, I ain't got no numbers, but <laughs> I, 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 I think that. You know, this, this is important. Dialogue is important. That's but sure, when, sure. when it comes to when it comes to the things going on in Chicago, um, and to be frank, in black communities all around this nation, yeah, it's, not just it's, Chicago. it's not just us it's involved not in this. No, there are a lot of hands pulling a lot of strings, oh, for sure. pointing us against each other. Oh, for sure. For and, sure. But but you know, it start it does it does start at home because. Yeah, because because we I think are in understanding that other people want us to fail. So gotcha. I think that when it comes like that when it comes to to the community and to stopping this killing, it, it it's about it, it's about investing in this community, you know, and investing in each other, yeah. and you know, be, being able to 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 build that infrastructure that they have took taken away from us yeah. and taken away from our communities and if it's not if it, if our tax dollars aren't going to go to good schools in the neighborhood then we got to make good schools in the neighborhood yeah right. and we have to have clinics in the neighborhood if they want to take out Planned Parenthood and they want to remove funding from mental health then we got to add funding those of us that are able to 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 make our own funds That's you right. know what I mean That's we got to right. add our funds That's back right. to our to community, community. Yeah. yes yeah. I agree like I, uh, the dialogue, you're correct. I mean, the dialogue is important. This is something yes. that we have to make sure that we know that there is this stigma. We know that there are things that we are reluctant to talk about, yeah. and we know that there are places that we're used to leaning that also should be accompanied with professional help yes. in a lot of cases. Uh, I think this dialogue is um, something I want to open up to everyone else. Uh, I know we want to make sure that the audience gets a chance to ask each of you questions as well. But for the panelists, is there anything else that you want to want to make sure that that you express I, I, I want to say I have um, six teenagers at my house right now my wallet is empty and generally um, we were talking earlier today about um, compassion fatigue mm. have any of you heard of this mm. my, my best friend is a teacher she's been in Compton and watched for the last 15, 20 years teaching, and so she talks to me about the kids a lot. So having these six kids in my house from ages 9 to 15, I am really getting a crash course in yeah. just talking yeah, um, to kids. Um, all of them are depressed. A uh, couple of them know they are depressed. All of them uh, have post-traumatic stress disorder, um, and it's really deep. Just trying to engage them on a daily basis, just trying to talk to them. You know, I catch each one of them at different points in the day like, what's up? What you doing? I mean, I, I know that I'm like the crazy old lady that's bugging them <laughs> this summer. <laughs> but every day, I'm just trying to engage them and talk to them about what's going on, what they're listening to. You know, they're in their phones constantly. So what's in your phone? What are you learning from your phone? Who are you talking to on your phone? I'm just trying to do my best to engage them. So I feel like... For me, it starts there with, with as many kids as I can, with as many people as I can, just trying to be open, to try to be a channel for peace and for change. That's great. That's great. There we go. And I had the, uh, I had the opportunity to, uh, to work with uh, Juvie, some, some former gang members, and uh, working at Twin Towers uh, with uh, groups and specifically groups that have suffered some type of PTSD or a lot of violence, not willing to admit they have PTSD or acute stress disorder, but they just, they endured some stuff. And it was like crickets and silence when we started, man. Nobody wanted to talk about anything. And when you can get one person to be vulnerable, like one person, it, oh, I mean, I was shocked. I was like, this sucks, man, because I've, I've got all these guys. I, it's my responsibility. Nobody's saying a word. And I'm like, it's like pulling teeth. Nothing's happening. And then I finally got to one guy in the group. And when he opened up about some of his experiences and not, you know, at first it was more bragging. It was like, yeah, yeah I did this and then I did that. But then eventually he opened up about how he felt inside when he did it. And at first he was like, I didn't feel anything. 
And I go, well then, did you start feeling something over time? And eventually he opened up. The minute he was vulnerable, I started to see the room completely change. And it's not like it was a magical cure or anything, but it was opening up dialogue emotionally. And, and I would just add, yeah, it's important to open up dialogue, but you can open up dialogue from an educational information perspective, or you can open up dialogue from an experiential emotional perspective. Yeah. And that's when you have long-lasting change, when you do that. Awesome. Break the seal. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, any, any questions? In the audience? I got something to say. Tech Nine. Uh, tech, tech Nine. nine tech Nine. Tech Nine. Okay, give us one second. I want to make sure we get on the mic because I know we have a live stream going. Oh, I got to talk on the mic? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wrapping the mic. Right. right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's cool. I've been clean off ecstasy, pure Molly, shrooms. Adderall, acid, and GHB for 11 years. All right. And sometimes, sometimes I would do it all in one night. Until one night in LA, and you know in LA when you're new here, you get it in abundance, you know what I mean? So I took 15 hits of ecstasy in one night. Oh man, that's crazy. And almost died of dehydration. So I had to make it up in my head, did I want to die or did I want to continue to build this empire, Strange Music? So I had to do it myself. I couldn't let nobody know because we can't talk about it. Yeah. Nobody needs to know, but your friends know that you're going through something, you know what I mean? So I didn't go to um, a hospital or anything like that. Um, I did it myself, mind power. You know what I mean? Because I wanted to live for my children. So I actually found something that makes me feel exactly like those drugs. A lady. Ah! <laughs> All right, you did. <laughs> I'm serious, though. Take my buddy. Well, praise God, brother. <laughs> Nothing like a good woman. <laughs> My name is Tori Brandon Reese. I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. I grew up around pimps, hustlers, and all that kind of stuff. My uncle was a pimp. I saw, at, a, at the age of 16, I worked in a nightclub. The top, top black nightclub in the city of New Orleans was a place called Mason's Las Vegas Strip. So I saw everything. Standing here today, I'm thinking about you, my brother, young brother in the middle, because I work at Lock High School, which is in Watts. And I was called to the school three years ago to deal specifically and directly with black male youth. So I created a program called See a Man, Be a Man. And I got brothers in the, in, in, in the community to go with me with no pay, no money's involved, to spend at least three or four hours a week with these young brothers. Now I want to say this. I, I, I'm resonating with everything you're saying because I asked a question to the young brothers about three weeks ago. I say, how many of you guys have been... Uh, called a bad name by your parents. Now, 85% of them come from a single parent home, female parent home. Their fathers are not there. So I know that their mothers are under stress and strain, like my mother who was a single parent and raised me and my three brothers, right? So I asked them, had they been you know, called a bad name by their parents? And 100% and, and of them raised their hand. Everybody in the class, about 23 uh, students raised their hand. And I asked them, what was the word that bothered them the most? And it was the N-word. So their mothers are calling them a little ugly, black N-word, and this and that and other thing. So this is generational trauma that we're dealing with. You talked about it coming from the home. It does start in the home. But there is a, there is a, a serious need for us as a community of sober-minded people to come together and wrap our arms around these young brothers and sisters and spend some time with them. We do a whole lot of talking. But it's time for us to give up some of those hours we spend looking at the basketball games and all that other stuff and come and spend some time with those young people because PTSD is real. Mm -hmm. I'm also a veteran, so I see that at the, at the VA every day, all over our community. Mm -hmm. People are in pain, you know, and we got we to gotta go beyond the conversation and get to some action. So anyone who want to be a mentor, holler at me. Mm, what up? Howdy, my name's Brian. My, uh, me my question's for Charlie. Hey. So Charlie, what, what led you to go that eighth time? 
to rehab? Like, what kind of could you kind of bring us through that if if you're willing to share? What led you to go to rehab that eight times? All the last. What did, yeah, we finally got you. Oh, uh, the last time I, w- I was on the streets because I was homeless, and so I-, I ran into a cousin of mine who looked very, very good. That we was, was used to get high together, and uh, when I saw her. Her skin was yellow. I mean, high. She was light skinned again, and I was just looking really good. <laughs> I'm like, damn, damn cuz, you, show, you look good, cuz. What are you doing? She's like, man. She said, I'm sober. I'm like, give me a hit. She's like, come on, I'm sober, cuz. I said, how long have you been so? Three years? I said, it's been three years? Oh my gosh, I felt so embarrassed. And uh, so she's like, she just, tears started rolling down her eyes, and, uh, and uh, she's like, she's like, cuz, you dying out here. I was like, Whatever. <laughs> she was like, you dying cause you gotta come in. And she was at a, re- she was like, she was, had been to this rehab, and, but she, now she was like a counselor. And she was, she talked me into that rehab. And uh, as a matter of fact, the next day, I went to the rehab. Mm. That was, that was the last time. And it was an active rehabilitation center. And I went there and, um, and that, she could only get me in a, 28 day program. I needed probably three years, but I, uh, yeah. that was serious talk. You know, I, I was like really not. I, if you'd have seen me, you'd have been like, oh my gosh, it's like I was the, the, the ugliest thing. I mean, I was just ridiculous looking, but um, um, they got me in this 28 day program. And, um, and for 14 days, I was, you know, acting like I was a superstar. They had a nickel in my pocket, they had nowhere to stay, and I was acting like I had dyed my hair red blonde. Can you see a matchstick? I was, I weighed about a hundred and something pounds. <laughs> like what I weighed in, in the seventh grade. That grown man weighed that much, you know, so I was pretty small. And, um, and, and so the last 14 days, I kind of got a hold to my spirit and um, broke down, and, um, and from there, I started get, gathering tools. But yeah, that was my a cousin who, Help me in there. Thank God for Shirley Bennett. Wow. <laughs> yes. Let's go right here, then we'll come back to you. Mm-hmm. This, uh, right there in the back. My name is Eric Nuri, and I've uh, been listening, and uh, so far, everything that we've talked about in terms of drugs have been party drugs. But, you know, we lost Michael and we lost Prince to opioid addictions, uh, resulting from uh, pain from accidents or injuries. So I'd like you to address the, the, uh, the, the new, uh, the new uh, challenge that we have of dealing with opioid addictions and deaths from overdoses. I had, I had uh, go ahead. You want me to talk? No, go ahead. go ahead. I'll take it up. Well, first, let me just say this. I, I had a, I, I had a back operation, and uh, man, I, I begged my doctor not to operate on my back. Then I was like, dude, you're not cutting on my back. And he says, you're not going to be able to walk if we don't cut on your back. And I was like, but, but let me tell you something. He gave me some of those, the steel, and, I, and it took me a minute to try to take those pills, man. I just like, I can't take those pills. And he's like, you got to take the medication, man.